so welcome everyone to the July. <laughs> Can it be July already? This is by by both sides. It's basically the slowest year, 18 months I can ever remember. And also it's going as fast as anything I can ever remember as well. It's a weird dichotomy at the moment. So we're into July already, um, July 2021. And today we are going to be discovering a fast way to debug in Salesforce with RFLib. Um, debugging, I think, is uh, dear to a number of our hearts. Um, seem to spend an awful lot of time doing that to try and track things down. So anything that can help us on that be awesome. Um, so here's our agenda. Um, the usual bit of a chat we've just been having, a little bit of community news, not a huge amount going on this month by the look of it. Uh, then we'll have our main talk. Uh, then we'll well we'll have a quiz and prizes, but there's also a bit of a quiz and prizes halfway through the main talk as well. So make sure you pay attention. Um, and then we'll do more chit chat until we all go out and play in the nice sunshine or Todd has to go and corral his children uh, in the garden. <laughs> With his broken <book> talk. <laughs> So um, thanks to our sponsors, as always, Mobile Caddy and BrightGen, which allows us to record these and then post do post-production and get them up on our YouTube channel, um, which everyone should subscribe to. I hope you're all, um, you will follow that. Um, so community news, I'm going to actually hand over to Todd for this particular slide because he's one of the co-organisers of London's Calling. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, so... First off, if people don't know what London's Calling is, it's uh, one of the community uh, Salesforce events that's been running annually now in London. Uh, the past two have been virtual events uh, due to, um, I guess, obvious obvious reasons. Um, but we're hoping that next year we'll be back in person. Fingers crossed, a little bit of a caveat on that. Um, so if you want to save the date for June the 10th, 2022, um, then that's when we're planning on, on, on going ahead. Um, we're in early organisation mode at the moment, so there isn't too much to disclose at present, apart from, um, yeah, if you fancy um, coming along to one of these community events, you've not been before, I think they're amazing. Um, all the talks of our past years are actually up on our YouTube channel and our website. So if you go to londonscalling.net, you can find all the content there from past years to see the sort of stuff that we cover. Um, It'll be for, for devs, admins, uh, business users, uh, MarTech, um, all sorts of architects, the, the, the whole, the whole uh, broad church, I guess. Um, so yeah, if you head to londonscalling.net, sign up for our mailing list um, and we'll be in touch when more information comes out. But um, yeah, that's it. 10th of June, 2022, hopefully in person. I can't wait. Cool. Thanks, Keir. Cheers. Awesome. awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Oh. Oh. How weird. Right, it seems to have stopped. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely would um, agree with what Todd was saying there. Um, it's a cracking day out as well. Just the, the chances for networking are great. We get quite a lot of visitors from the US and from uh, the rest of Europe coming over to that. So it's, yeah, it's a really good day out. Um, so community, more community news now. So if you're a partner, the learning camp ex exams, most of them, I think there's still one or two that aren't, but they're live now. So you can sign up for those. Um, I believe they're $150 a go. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we've seen any vouchers for those yet, but maybe that'll be the kind of thing we'll be able to have um, in terms of vouchers at our um, user group. Um, so Dreamforce 21, um, we're not actually that far off of it now, 21st to the 23rd of September. Um, it's a global event, which is currently San Francisco, New York, London and Paris. So global being Northern Hemisphere um, and US and <laughs> Central Europe. So um, there might be something for those in the Southern Hemisphere, you never know. Um, but it's going to be invitation only. It's going to be limited numbers. So this won't be the usual um, 160,000 people descending on San Francisco, but it will be digital as well. So everyone should have a chance to attend. Um, but it'll be a hybrid event this year, as opposed to last year when it went fully digital. Um, and as we mentioned, the idea prioritization is complete. So if you want to see the list of what won, um, yeah, spoiler alert, spanning fields won by about 200,000 points. Um, and I, I must admit, I didn't even look at what else was on there in all honesty. Um, but yeah, so pop over to that and have a look. Um, so that's the end of our introduction bit. I'm now going to hand over to our speaker, who's going to tell us all about discovering a lightning fast way to debug in Salesforce. So Fantastic. over to you guys. Thank you very much, Kier. Let me see if I can get the sharing going here. Um, okay. So is it is it okay, um, Kier, if you or Todd would be monitoring the chat for any questions? Absolutely. That, are coming up? that would be super helpful because um, I'm going to minimizing things here okay. to focus on my slides. <clears throat> All right. Well, hello, everyone. 
And let's get this started. Everyone can see my screen? Yes. That's good. Yep. Lovely. Yep. Fantastic. So welcome um, to my first presentation outside of North America, which is really exciting for myself. So thank you very much to the, to the leaders of this group to um, allow me to present my, my, little, my little baby on the Salesforce side um, to, to this user group. I'm really, really excited about that. A quick start about myself. Um, my name is Johannes Fischer. I started out my career as a software engineer building applications in Java and .NET and eventually got exposed to the Salesforce ecosystem by integrating software applications into the Salesforce platform, so building CTI adapters. Um, from there, I eventually moved over to pure platform development and, and package development as part of uh, ISV partnership. And then later on in my career, I switched over to the consulting side. So I got a little bit of a flavor of, of these three different areas um, throughout my over 10 years in the ecosystem. Fantastic. Now, this picture here is uh, a close, close picture of me like about 10 to 15 years ago when I started my career. So as I started out as a software developer, I was put on an application which is called an agent desktop or software application that allows contact center agents to handle incoming phone calls, emails, chat messages in the browser. And uh, so this application is, is very interactive. And in, in the mid 2000s, uh, late 2000s, when, when this was built, like a cloud wasn't that big of a deal. So the application was, was um, hosted and installed within the, our customers' environments. And it was heavily because of the phone calls coming in. So you have less predictability around like what is happening in the application. Now, the app itself was also like a little bit older, it was established, therefore carried a little bit of technical debt as well as um, it had logging, but, but it wasn't a very important part of the way how the app was built. There wasn't a lot of emphasis put, uh, put around it. And as you expect, like uh, while I would love to always work on feature development as we had an existing client base, bug reports were coming in. And all I had to go with was a small description of what a user said that happened and we all know like how much you can believe that or not, and log files. And as I mentioned, unfortunately, those logs were, were not providing me with often, in most cases, with enough details um, to actually really figure out what was going on in the application at the time and the problem occurred. So normally this would resolve um, in, in like having to ask more questions to the actual agent, like back and forth of email conversations, um, endless digging through the code of what could have happened and what, what path the, the, the code may have taken at the time when the problem occurred. And that was very, very painful. Like any kind of investigations typically took days, um, if not longer, and obviously led also to uh, like our customers not being very satisfied with, with that performance. The one thing that happened afterwards that was really, really uh, fantastic is we had the opportunity to actually build a new software application, a new generation of a software from scratch. And, and taking the learnings about how hard it was to debug in the previous version and, and taking that forward, we made locking a first-class citizen. We also switched things around a little bit from an implementation stack perspective because now JavaScript was a lot more powerful and we were able to move a lot of our business logic onto the client side in the browser. But that prompted us to have another issue, which is like, okay, we had good server locking. That was easy to solve, but what are we gonna do on the JavaScript side? Because we couldn't allow ourselves to run blind when it comes to actually what happens in the browser of an agent if there is any issue. So we came up with a logging framework that kind of like worked on the JavaScript side and was integrated into the backend so that we never needed to actually have access to the browser in order to view the logs, but be able to consume them in a consolidated form as the any log information were sent over when a problem was reported. And, and that was a life changer, like really debugging issues and, and really complicated ones has gotten like a lot easier that way. At the peak, um, or like at the peak, like one of the most exciting examples that I like to bring up when, when I talk about this, this uh, logging framework that we had back then was that we were able to prove uh, a packet loss on the network level for one of our clients during peak hours. 
where they just came to us and complained about how our uh, user sessions were constantly dying because we had a very aggressive timeout setting, right? An agent that cannot actually answer a phone should not, a phone call should not be getting a phone call because that would be really bad for the end customer experience. And so what happened is that we were able through the log files to actually say like, look, here we're getting our um, heartbeat request and we're sending the response back, but the response never arrived on the client side. We have the proof like through the detailed logging on both sides that allowed us to actually create that type of uh, narrative when we talk to our client and push them and they were really resistant at the beginning but push them then towards actually looking at the network layer where they find out that, hey, there is actually a packet loss happening. So this should just show you a little bit that I, I obviously grew up in an environment where locking was very, very important. I carried that through my entire career. And when I started doing more and more in Salesforce, obviously I was looking at, at accomplishing like similar goals from, from getting transparency and visibility into what is happening in a production environment um, when dealing when dealing um, with any kind of, of issues that are being locked. And naturally, because Salesforce obviously is established has a gigantic ecosystem and, and a community that is providing providing open source software, just like my, my own library here, I started out not trying with the, with the approach, hey, I need to build something, but like looking at, okay, what is out there in the market? Is there something that, that fulfills my needs and that I can use? And so when I started looking around it, and especially during my consulting career, like I learned that A, a lot of companies are actually still running blind, meaning that they did not pay, pay enough attention to logging. So there was still a general need in the market to A, educate, but also then provide um, helpers to actually do logging and doing it well and making it easy, which is a really important part about it. When it came to the frameworks that were there, like I found there was, a lot of like silos, there were little frame, like frameworks builder did one thing and one thing only, which is okay. But the way how Salesforce works with dependency management and all that kind of stuff, it makes it really difficult to kind of integrate two things together. So when you had a logging framework and a trigger framework, they were fantastic on their own. But if you wanted to add logging to the trigger framework, well, either you had to change the code, which made the upgrade path more difficult, or you had to, um, you were not even able to do any changes because you were dealing with a package and that was locked down. Another issue that I found was that um, a lot of the frameworks around logging in particular were focused on the APIC side only. Um, that's great, but Salesforce has invested a lot into alternative technologies over the recent years. We have two front end stacks with Aura and LWC. We have heavy investments on the flow side process builder that came out before. Like there was a lot more happening as part of your uh, customizations on the Salesforce platform that was not covered with those frameworks. And that was uh, a gap that I wanted to address. And then the same thing with the code only portion, right? We, we, I already mentioned like the, the flow side of things. So we have backend only code and then the front end portion needed to be covered as well as the administrative side on the flow and process builder um, level. Especially when you look at flow and process builder, there was a tweet a while ago, I think it was last, last year around Christmas that really caught my eye when someone said like, hey, process builder and flows are actually just languages on the Salesforce platform, just like Apex, LWC and, and Aura in that sense. And it's true, right? They are just different frameworks that we use to build things on the platform. So why would we not want the same abilities to actually diagnose and, and debug and monitor um, as we have it in, in Apex already. So what is RFLIP exactly? Well, RFLIP is basically combining my experiences from the earlier years with the gap and the knowledge that I, uh, the gaps in the market and the knowledge that I, I accumulated through working on the Salesforce platform and, and built into basically one, one uh, library ecosystem. Uh, it's meant to serve as a solid foundation of your org that you build your customizations around it and, and hopefully do that in a cleaner and better way. There's the repository link at the bottom. Um, I personally like to always browse through the, 
to the code bases when I attend any kind of presentations and look at the, that stuff on the side. Um, so feel free to do that. Feel free to ask questions about things you discover in the code if um, at the end of the presentation, more than happy to answer those. So at its core, RFLib consists out of three um, modules and each of those modules is a package on its own. I'm using unlock packages, so there's no namespaces, meaning you can install them and still override the code if you really want to. Though, as you will see in a little bit, in a little bit when I go about the configuration aspects, there are cleaner ways to actually um, modify the functionality of the package itself. Now, these packages also have a hierarchy, meaning they're depending on one another. The locking framework is at the core, so that's the the, the one and standalone package that you can also just install on your on your own. Um, but if you want the feature switches, you are getting, you need to have the logging framework installed. And the reason is that like there's logging embedded into all the other frameworks. So the trigger framework as well, especially heavily logging enabled so that you always see what's going on in your triggers as you're using it. And that comes out of the box. The intent um, of, the, of the RFLIP framework was not like to just build competition to what exists um, today, because there are many great frameworks out there and I definitely don't want to um, dismiss all the value that they, they bring to the company's organization. But my intent was to um, like celebrate the beauty of innovation, which is to learn from those great libraries that are out there and then still push it to the next step, to the next level around. And I hope that um, I, I have accomplished that at least to some extent. All right, so let's talk about logging in Salesforce and we'll start a little bit with the more general approach of logging and looking at that before we actually go to the details of the, the logging component or the logging module of RFLIP. When you approach logging, or at least the way I do it, is that it, the idea is that your code tells a story. Like when I want to read logs, I want to be able to see what happened in the story to that particular user that is describing that they had a problem. And I want to understand how they got there, right? And so we are instrumenting our code with log statements in order to buy, provide more details about the execution context. And in Salesforce, the execu execution context is either a Apex transaction, or when you look at the browser side, it is the browser session itself. It's important that we're making the logs in a way so that they're easy to consume, right? So we want to use more of a, of a language approach while it can still be a little bit more technical in, in uh, like with details that we're providing. At the end of the day, we want to um, be able for the users to read it in English and not have like a look at the code base itself, like in the logs, like reflected in that way. That That's not great. So we want to use normal language to describe situations and how decisions are being made within our code base. And, and we want to describe the, the state of the application, um, meaning we want to see what variables, um, what values variables have at the time when the execution happens, because that supports us to understand what path the code is taking and why. Now, many of these things can be done in combination with Apex debug logs. There is no question about that. Um, but most of the content does not really refer in the Apex debug logs about the business logic. And that makes it really hard sometimes to process to process the Apex debug log because there's just so much more noise in it. So what RFLib does, it's not meant to replace the Apex debug, Apex debug log, but to actually complement them by providing you a filtered look on your business logic first. And only if you're not able to identify the problem that way, then you have the means to go to Apex debug log to really go deep on the platform level to find out what is going on. Okay, there is no right or wrong with logging altogether. Like that's the important part. The, the, what is really critical is that you are using log statements, that you're logging in your application. And, and that's really, if you want to walk away with one thing today, then that's logging is important. And you will hear me say that at the end of the, of the presentation um, again, because that really is the essential part. It doesn't matter if you use RFLIP or anything else, it's, it's about being able to look at your business logic and be able to um, retrieve the, the core information about what, what the intent of your code is in order to understand where you need to look in order to identify issues. 
So we're trying to create an enriched stack trace. And in order to do that, we have to be really rigorous about how we do logging, um, at least from a best practices perspective. And that in my perspective means we are logging pretty much almost every branch of our code base. That starts with the methods at the beginning. You want to have an entry that uh, shows that you're entering a certain method, as well as then when you go through if statements um, that you show which branch within the message was uh, method was actually taken. So if you're looking here as an example from my own code base, um, every method here at the beginning has an info statement. And normally there's some context information that is being um, added to it. Sometimes it's the arguments that you're passing in or, or like local, local properties of the class that you're dealing with. You don't have to necessarily like add a log statement, for instance, in this line here, because based on the previous one, it's pretty clear which path was taken in this particular situation. But in, in general, like you wanna look into trying to be very generous um, about your logs. When it comes to logging in Salesforce, um, one guidance that I have as well is, and that sounds a little bit weird with what I just said, um, is to reduce the number of log statements. So I just said, be generous with the logs. And I mean that you wanna a log like every branch, but I've seen a lot of developers in my life that actually create multiple log statements in a row. So they say logger info message one, then logger info message two, and then three rows in a row, like have one message. Well, with Salesforce, we're dealing um, with a lot of like resource constraints and governor limits. And while the, the framework is, is meant to, is optimized in order to work around those as much as you can, the best benefit you get out of it by actually combining more text into a single statement than to create multiple uh, log statements in a row. So that's just a recommendation here. And then there's one thing that is often really overlooked and that is um, the log levels. Choosing the right log levels for your statements is a really, really important aspect for logging because you have um, uh, the means to actually like abstract through the log levels and get different level of visibility on your code base. And RFLib makes actually heavily use of that on the configuration side. So pay attention when you do logging, not just, you know, about having statements in there. It's not just about, you know, using system.debug and putting in a message, but actually considering what level that message is is plays a really, really important part. So how does RFLib differ from other frameworks that I've seen in the market? And again, like there's a lot of great frameworks out there. If you're already using one, there's no point of changing, but um, maybe there are some reasons why, why it makes sense for you to consider uh, a switch, or if you're starting out, then definitely make sure to take a look um, at what the library has to offer. One of the things that I haven't seen so far um, out there is the support for the Lightning Web Components and ORM. Like with RFLib, you have full configurable logging support from the client side. And as I mentioned in my initial story, you will see those logs on the server side posted and you don't have to go to the browser and actually to get visibility for it. We have the process builder and flows covered with invocable actions and there's a lot of frameworks that go in and, and basically post every message, like whether posting, when I say posting, I mean publishing it either through a platform event or by writing it to a custom object. Well, RFLib uses platform events, just to mention that on the side. Um, but what it does that is, that is a little bit unique is it actually uses a stack to collect log statements before you publish. So meaning, that like you may have info statements in your in your code base and they all the statements that are like created as part of a transaction, they go into the stack. And only when you hit a threshold block message, which normally is like a warning or an error message, then the library takes everything that's in the stack and then puts that into the message that it actually publishes. So you see the entire history in one platform event instead of having one platform event for each of the messages. And that's really, really important differentiation because it reduces the number of platform events that are being created and, and work uh, count towards your governor limits. Um, there's a rich configuration for that you can, uh, where you can use custom settings to modify, uh, modify the behavior of the log framework. Um, and that's very useful, especially when you need to do deep dives 
for your for your uh, clients or your users that you can override those settings on a user base. Um, I, I put a feature in for masking log messages. Uh, I personally work a lot in the public sector where there's a, a very um, big sensitivity towards like PRI. And while you don't always can prevent developers from adding log statements that it, like inadvertently expose possible PI information, you can possibly look into writing uh, regex rules that will automatically mask those in the log messages as they're being published. Um, and then one of the key things is the 24 seven monitoring, right? Apex logs, debug logs, you need to turn on. You, it's, it's, it's a reactive way of debugging on the platform, meaning that uh, issue happens, you turn on the Apex logs and tell the user try to reproduce it. Well, first of all, that is cumbersome, right? Because you need to engage the user to do the same thing again. Second, for some issues, reproduction might not be as easy. So with RF lip monitoring being on like all the time and only reporting when something happens, you always capture the log details for when the actual issue occurred. And, and you have something, at least some information to start with. That doesn't mean that you may not have to go back and ask the user for more information or maybe retry it as well, but it, it at least gives you a starting point other than like saying, okay, let me turn on locking and then we'll see where we go from here. And then there are a few utility classes that I created that um, help accomplish some more things such as like logging timings between different execution times, et cetera, that, that can be very helpful. When we're looking at the uh, configuration settings and you just see here an example, um, you see that there's a lot of different log levels that are being set up. Um, I'm not going through all of them in details, but like basically there's a lot that you can configure based on the log levels. There's full configuration for how the client side behaves versus how the server side behaves. So you can have different settings depending on, on whether you're dealing with Apex or JavaScript. Um, the one thing I do want to highlight though is like those two pieces here. We have a logger factory class and a logger log timer class. And, and what that means is that RFLib uses dependency injection. So when you follow some of the standard practices, and we'll see what those are in just uh, a minute, um, you will actually use by default the, the implementations that come with the framework out of the box. But if you have the need to actually change those for whatever reason, instead of modifying the package itself, you can make a copy of a class that you need to modify. And then um, by overriding the setting, change like what um, implementation RFLib uses for the actual logging aspect. And, and that can be super helpful because you can fix a bug this way in the logger, um, use your own implementation, but you still maintain a full upgrade path from a package perspective where you can install a new feature, um, a new version of the, of the package, and then uh, utilize that with your own implementation still. As long as you inherit to the interfaces, you're, you're good to go and, and have your own implementation on there. So if Salesforce, for instance, in a few years from now says they have this new awesome logging framework um, that they're coming out themselves, and you used RFLib and you have it in your business logic all over the place, well, you don't have to change every single class over to use the, uh, the Salesforce framework. What you're gonna do is you build a wrapper um, of a logger, an implementation of the interface that RFLib comes with, and then do basically the handover of the log statements to Salesforce and then change the configuration here and all your other classes are taken care of. So in that sense, it's, it's forward compatible in case you ever wanna switch, but not wanna refactor all your classes. All right, so this is how you would use RFLib in your Apex code. Um, what we see in the top here is this is like my convention, doesn't mean that you need to follow it per se. It's my recommendation based on using my own framework for, for a few years now. Um, you start with in, uh, declaring a logger instance in your class on the top as a static, as a static member. Um, always use the logger util that get factory because that is how you actually use the configuration value that I just discussed in the custom settings. And then you call create logger and give it a string and name. And this is really important because it will help you filter log events later on when you start processing them and reading them around it. You can use any kind of string here that, that, you, that you like. Um, I generally go with the class names, that's my recommendation, but anything is, is fair game here. 
we're looking here at an aura controller. So we have um, basically a standard model for a, a controller method that you're seeing here. Uh, normally try catch block at the, at the beginning, followed by a lock statement that basically says like, hey, we entered this method. And you see here placeholders for, for the um, actual variables that we want to inject that makes it a little bit easier to write and read the lock messages um, as, you, as you're coding, as you're writing your code. And then normally you have your, your catch blocks, depending on your situation, at least one catch all that then would be like lock a fatal statement and then throwing the aura exception back to the, to the client side. And then you see here an example of the use of the lock timer utility, where you can basically start a timer and say like, look, let's start a timer here. And when I'm done, I wanna look how, lo how much time passed between those two points. If it's more than 300 milliseconds, then lock this message um, to as a warning message to my logs. So this is very really handy when you're dealing with requests where there's integration involved and you have like SLAs that you generally want to adhere to. You can have the framework log um, like messages and tell you when there's maybe a health issue with that integration where it's not as performant as you would like to see it. On the Aura side, it's very really similar and I try to be as consistent from an API perspective as possible you declare a logger component in your component file, um, give it an ID, by convention I recommend to always use logger, a name, which is the context name that we just saw before. My best practice is to always use the name of the component. And then in Aura, there's one special feature, which is a Penti component ID. If you're setting this to true, the framework actually provides you with component IDs. You have access to those information. And what you what the, what the library then does is for every log message, it appends the ID to the context, meaning that you, if you have one component multiple times on the page, you can actually distinguish um, what messages came from what component, at least like you don't know necessarily where they were on the screen, but you know that these messages are grouped to one component and these are from another one. So you're not getting confused about what happens and think it's all happening, happening in the one place. In every JavaScript method in the controller helper, you start by getting the reference to the logger um, from the component. And then you can start your logging in the same way. You have the placeholder syntax available and then the same log levels and everything else that you're used to from the Apex side too. In Lightning Web Components, things are a little bit different. You start out by importing the factory method from the, from the module. And then I usually create a constant on the before I actually declare the class. Um, so the export on, on the, in the file. And again, we have our log context and then log messages are just posted the same way how we've seen it in the Aura side. One tiny little difference is you don't need to wrap the additional arguments into uh, an array. So with the enlightening web, uh, web components, what you can do is just basically chain the arguments together, comma separated as many as you want to. And then it uses everything following the actual log message and, and puts it into the index as a replacement. All right, so I started out um, like with an email notification system to when there was a platform event like published, uh, an email was eventually sent out. And, and that worked well for five minutes until I started, I get, uh, noticed I get a lot of emails like during development in production, it's okay. But for every other environment, it became really noisy and really annoying. So I looked around and, and got inspired by some of the other frameworks that are in the market that actually have built this dashboard to view the logs. And I thought that's a great idea. And I put that in uh, to our flip as well. So you have a dashboard where you can actually monitor the logs. You can decide whether you wanna have them just come in real time, whether you wanna look back because platform events are being um, uh, cached on the platform for up to 72 hours. So you can actually retrospectively look at, at historic events and, uh, and then process them. Look at the details, as you can see here on the right-hand side. Filter the logs, um, especially in, in production environments there, there's a lot of traffic and you might have um, issues identifying or filtering certain messages out. You can provide those filters and they are live applied as to the messages that are coming in. 
And then eventually you can easily download the file as well, export it into a text file, and then send it around to the developers or um, whoever needs to take a look at things. So it makes it easy to share um, if you don't have access to the production work, for instance, where someone doesn't have access to the production work. The library also supports like the Apex request ID. So if you do have Apex debug logs going, you will be able to combine or easily identify which log on the RFLIP side actually matches what log on the Apex debug side or event monitoring, if, if that's needed. And that's it so far for the logging framework. We'll stop here to quickly go over the quiz and then dive into an actual live demo where you can see RFLIP in action and then go on to the remaining two packages at the end. Here, back to you. Great, thanks, Johannes. So we did get a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first one, I think you just answered at the end there, but I'll let you give a full answer to it. Do these logs get saved in any object? They are not, um, but I'm, I'm, they're sent out as platform events. And I, I did that by design because when I started out, actually I started out by saving them um, into a, a custom object because platform events weren't there. When I, when I initially um, did the, the Apex framework um, portion of, of the Apex portion of the framework. But with the platform events, I like those ones a lot more because it gives you more flexibility. So nothing stops you of creating a custom object that matches the, the structure of the platform event and then creating just a, a simple flow that takes a, a platform event when it is created and then writes it to the custom object. So this is an add-on that you can very easily do yourself but I didn't feel that the framework needed to do that out of the box because I was especially concerned for storage space on the for production orgs because it's a very sensitive um, topic, especially when you ram out of storage because the logger like fills it up and you have to maintain that, right? You need to clean the logs from the objects, et cetera. So that's why the framework doesn't do it out of the box. Okay, um, the next question was, won't debugging 24 seven slow down the org, the performance of the org? That's a very good question. Um, so yes, there's extra processing happening, right? So you have, there's this code that is being run and run all the time um, as you do your logging. And I would say the performance, the, uh, the, the performance hit that you get from that is absolutely um, minimal and negligible in my opinion. So. I, I've done this logging in many orgs before. I've never had logging actually be a reason for performance issue by any means. Um, it slows down maybe the, the execution of your, of your transaction by a few milliseconds, but not more than that. And, uh, but the value that you're getting out of it by having those diagnostics available, like in 99.9% in, in .9 of the cases, I would say like it always outweighs the performance issues that you might be concerned about. That's that's my personal take from okay, my thank team. you. I, when, when I go cool. back so the to next the two, one, um... just one more sentence, like when I go back to that performance, um, like to that soft phone application, like we had a thousand uh, concurrent users handling phone calls. Like we low tested with 15 phone calls per second as, as, as something the application can handle, which is 15, 15 calls per second. That's kind of like the largest organizations you can think of from a contact center perspective, like your AT&T or whatever. They're dealing with such volumes. Normal organizations don't even scratch on one call per second. And we had the locking in place um, heavily front and client side. And it was always writing, always writing to the disk and there was no performance hit that was in any way like impacting the user experience. And it's very similar here as well. Sorry, here, for interrupting. It's all right, that's fine, that's fine. Better that people hear from you than from me. Um, so the next one, I'm not sure I quite understand the question, so I'm gonna unmute Irving and ask Irving to um, unmute and ask the question if you can. Uh, hi, Jonas. Um, good presentation. Thanks. Um, so basically, um, in a org I've seen, um, we used um, uh, Sales Cloud to um, handle car credit card payments and uh, transactions. So the uh, information was um, typed into um, one of the windows. So an iframe is isolated from the rest of the page, but um, can the login actually access that information? Uh, no, it wouldn't. 
that's a very interesting scenario. It would not be able to work in that context. It would be able to capture um, if your iframe is embedded into a custom component, um, or which will force patch for the matter, shouldn't, shouldn't be different, then you would be able to, to deal with that, that um, you can have logging around it and, and know how that iframe was initialized and maybe what, like usually those iframes use query parameter in the URL to have some key information being passed over, right? Um, for the payment processors. So you would be able to capture these details as the page is being loaded, but what happens on the page itself that would be protected through the context of the other domain and we wouldn't have any visibility into that. All right, thank you. It, it's part of the process security aspect. Like if, if the framework would have access to that, that, that means malicious code would be able to get to details on that side too. Cool. Um, so uh, the next question, I'm not sure. I think that probably needs a slightly more context from Oliver Schofield. Ollie, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So it's it's really about how how it performs with 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 a managed package. Uh, specifically, if say for example, I'm a customer and I end, I have a managed package installed, um, <clears throat> um, I try and debug it, and all I get is entering managed package. Mm -hmm. uh, 150 lines or whatever um, uh, with an occasional occasional SOC query or whatever um, so do you are you able to get sort of log statements with managed packages and, and uh, can you talk briefly about how that how that works yeah so un unfortunately um, unfortunately not um, so let's let's start with two scenarios out the way I, I see um, how this would go. Number one is the log, like the, the managed package doesn't use logging. There's no way to access anything on that code base because it's part of the, the managed package. Um, uh, what's the right word I'm looking here for? The managed package um, deployment mechanism to actually how they be, how managed package are, are dealt with on the Salesforce platform to, to protect the IP of the vendor, right? So you have no way to actually get visibility into that from, from, from the outside. Um, the one thing that could work theoretically speaking is if the managed package was actually using the RFLIP framework as well and, and using that to collect their own logging statements, you could have a dedicated log file or a log message from that particular package that you should be able to configure through the custom settings. And then the way how they would want to expose their own logs, you would be able to do that. Um, and then see those log files, they would still be isolated and not like share the, the same messages because the stacks would be different. There would be two log stacks involved, um, but it would allow you to possibly get some information there. And if you use the dependency injection settings, you would be able to actually identify a class of your own um, that should be used for the logging like from within the package. So what you could do is you could say, if if the package was using RFLIP, you could say, use my own logger implementation, like use my own logger tools from my own org and not the one within the namespace of the app. And then it would be consolidated. So is it in theory possible? Yes, it is. Um, it would require managed packages to actually use the framework as well, which I would love to see, <laughs> to be honest, because I know those pains, I'm dealing with that on a daily basis as well. And um, to get that visibility, because otherwise it's only the vendors, the vendor support team that actually has access to those details. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, and our final question in the chat at the moment, do you see any exceptions with platform event limits? So do you hit the number of events published per hour limit or anything like that? Yeah, it, it's it's something that you need to manage. Unfortunately, um, and I'm more than happy if someone has great ideas, but the way I see it, publishing, publishing the logs, whatever way is possible, you're always dealing with limits on the Salesforce platform. So either you deal with how many objects you can, records you can write to, the, the storage space, if you were to use a custom object, um, you, you're dealing with um, platform event limits at the same way, rate, like on a, on a 24 hour perspective, as well as within the transaction. 
um, it, it comes down to tweaking the settings of how much you want to actually, um, how, how much you want to, you want, how noisy you want the framework to be, as well as looking at it from uh, how, how your average occurrence of, of platform events coming from the logging framework match with the load that you have for your own business functionality. And then you need to just manage that volume. Um, you can always turn it off on the RF flip side. Obviously you would be then lose entire logging information and, and details um, and, and would have to revert to the debug logs in the same way as you used to if you're running close to the limits or you may have to expand your limits in order to, to have RF flip live side by side to your regular um, platform events demands for the lack of a better term. All right, thank you very much. Uh okay, so we're diving next into the demo. And, uh, and as you can see, uh, there is actually another repository link down here. So the entire code base of the demo, if you wanna take a look, is, is also available on GitHub. Um, just in case if you want to get more inspiration on how, how the framework is used in, in the context of what you're seeing. So just about that. And now let's switch things up here um, and go to this tab. So here we're covering two scenarios today. Um, one is going to be a DML issue uh, where we also take a quick sneak peek into what you can do a little bit with the feature switches. And then the second one is the, the, real, um, the real star of the show, which is a data inconsistency problem in the code base where there's actually no error message um, and, and how you would go about debugging that with a framework. We're using the Dreamhouse application. So I thought that was a fantastic um, tool that everyone is familiar with um, or may, may or not be familiar with, but it's a, a great starting point from an application. So what I've done is I took the the Dreamhouse app and then started modifying their code base by adding my login into it. And if you're familiar with the Dreamhouse application is that it, it comes always in the scratch work blank without data, but they have this sample data import tool that you can use in order to um, get, get all the properties and, and the Dreambot um, commands kind of defined. So when I click on this button here, what, what you will see is that hey, the request failed. So this would be kind of like a representation of an error scenario that your clients may encounter for whatever reason. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the RFLIP monitor. And what we're seeing here is, hey, look, there is a, a message in there. Let me just move one second here. I think, can I move this just at the bottom? I think that's better. Um, look, there's already a message here that the monitor shows. Um, and let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, so we're seeing a timestamp, which is uh, what you're looking at my local time here out of Calgary. I'm, I'm located in, in Canada on the West Coast. Um, you see what user was actually behind the issue that was requested, uh, that was posted here, what log level um, prompted the, the event to be sent out and then the context. And this is this, this message that I showed in the code boxes earlier. So you see where the error actually is coming from. You have a first indication. And when you click on this, you see then even more details coming out of it. And one thing, for instance, you have the username, uh, sorry, the user ID here, but on the right hand side, that user is actually being resolved by the monitor. So it, it finds out who the name is of the person, what profile that they have, because you know, in many cases, it's important to understand what the security level is that, that the user um, is, is, uh, is managed with. And then you find some contact information as well. So instead of users actually reaching out to uh, IT desk, now you have the ability to actually reach out to them and say like, look, I found out you had an issue. Can you please tell me more about it? And then here are the different log messages from the context. So it starts from the top down historically. So this is the first message that was recorded. You can see here the sample data controller import sample data method was invoked. And then you see different things that are happening within the method. It was deleting the previous records, uh, doing some more stuff. You see here even a message from the trigger framework as it's starting to populate things. And if you go and scroll to the bottom, that's usually where you find um, the, the meat of, of the issue, which is the error message. 
Um, and what we're seeing here is fail to import sample data. And the message says, hey, um, insert failed because there was a custom um, validation exception. Your property is too old to be listed. So what I've done is I actually I, I added a um, validation rule to the to the project that says like any property that's being inserted cannot be older than 14 days. And since we're dealing with a data load scenario here, obviously that should not really fire in, in that particular situation. So now let's just review, redo the same thing again, because I wanna show you how quickly you're coming from error occurred to actually log message being displayed. So I'm pressing the button again, and you saw within a second or two, the message showed up in the monitor. And the same thing would happen if you had email notifications being sent out, they would be already on their way to your inbox at this point and inform you that there's a problem in production. So how are we gonna fix this? Well, let's look at the custom um, metadata. Oops, so I went one too far. I actually need to go to the object manager. Come here. No. There we go. Go to the uh, property <laughs> object. Take a look at the validation rules. And here we see this is the validation rule that just fired. And if you look at the details, we see that there's actually a feature switch um, part of the rule. So that allows us to actually use the feature switch framework to disable the validation rule from firing. So if we're looking at the feature switches here and we wanna manage the records, we have a rule that says data load in progress. I'm gonna edit that and turn on that switch. Hit save, go back to my sample import and hit import. And now the whole data import succeeded. Fantastic. Now that we have the data um, included, we can conclude our scenario one. So we saw how there was a DML exception that eventually was recorded in the framework, gave us the details that um, we needed in order to identify that was a validation rule that caused the problem. And we were able to use the uh, feature switch framework in order to disable the rule, at least for the purpose of, of this data load so that afterwards we could turn it on again and, and move forward um, with the, uh, having the, the validation we're running. So we made those changes with configuration without touching the actual metadata around it as much. Now let's go to the tricky scenario. We have this property finder here. So there's a lots of properties that you can search for and filter for. And um, like what we wanna do here, for example, is we're gonna go and search for three bedrooms and four bathrooms. And when you look at the results now, there's some inconsistency here. Like there should be a minimum four baths and three bedrooms per listing that we are getting back. But you actually see some listings coming back here that have only three bathrooms. So why is that the case? And imagine like you being in the situation that like one of your users calls you up and says like, hey, look, I'm using the filter search here, but the results, they are not right. Well, let's take a look at the monitor application again. Um, there were no errors being reported because technically there was no error. There's just wrong results. So why is that the case? And that's the part where you start like then to engage with the user. And yes, you need to, in this situation, reproduce the problem and in order to figure out what's going on. But you need more diagnostics because obviously you didn't have any error messages. So what you're gonna do there is you start using the logger settings in order to reduce the log levels and make our flip chattier. So what we're doing here is two things. Number one, we're changing the log reporting level for the client side. So we have the client server log level, which is currently warning, which means you need a warning statement, error or fatal for any messages to be sent out and recorded as a platform event. And we're switching that now to info. That means every info message is going to be reported. The other thing that we're doing just for demonstration purposes is I changed the client console log level. So I'm gonna go in, this is currently set to none. I'm going to change that to debug just for fun so that you see the flexibility that you have. I'm gonna click save. 
in order for those settings to take effect, you will have to change, uh, refresh the page. So that's just a must. But I want to show you quickly the debug clocks here in the console. And you see there's actually nothing being recorded. And it would have recorded any kind of statements that were there, like as we're changing settings here. So if I go left and go right again, you saw there was activity on the page, but there's nothing happening in the console. So now I'm going to go and hit refresh. And I'm going to bring up the monitor side because you will see things that are happening now very really differently. You see a lot more chatter happening. And we see that there were 13 events just created as we loaded the page. And all of them have the info lock level. And now I'm going to go on and clear this out and then start using the application. Oops, switch this to three and then go to four. And you see here, now that we changed the logging setting for console logs to debug, the front end is super chatty too. So this is the setting that you would use during your own development, right? To see it right in the browser. But in production, you don't want your users to actually see the diagnostic information if they're bored and start you know, looking around what your implementation looks like, especially not if you're exposing logging on the community side where you actually have end customers that are, that are poking around your, your application. So, I'm going to close that again because that was just uh, a quick sidetrack. And we're going back to now we've reduced the problem. We have the three bathrooms still showing up. So let's see what our locking can tell us in order to figure out what's going on. Well, I know that the component that is responsible for um, those filter changes is the property filters component because I'm obviously a developer. I have understanding of my, my implementation. And the context allows me to actually figure that one out very quickly. But I can go in and just here filter, um, filter out and say, like, I want everything that has uh, a filter list in or look for the lock messages. I'm going to search here. Um, I want to have every filter message that is that is part of it. And as we're starting looking through those ones and go like to the bottom again a little bit, what we see here is, okay, there's a filter change event that happened, great. Um, the filter itself was reporting number of bedrooms was three and number of bathrooms was four. And then it switched here to uh, get properties um, function that is being invoked. But as you can see, the number of bedrooms is now four and the number of bathrooms is three. So the information that the logs provided on an info level tell us that, hey, there's actually, there's actually a disconnect between the data of what it should be. And one of the things that is really beautiful as well is you know, the log messages itself are part of your code base. So they are an ideal way of actually getting to your code very, very quickly. So I'm going to copy out this piece here from the statement. And then I'm going to bring up my, my actual Visual Studio code and do a file in search for this particular portion. It's a hard-coded string. Like even in a minified way, you can actually search for log statements in your minified code version and find like the actual, if you need to debug in the browser console and find the pieces of code that are being executed at a certain spot. So it works both ways of very quickly identifying places in the code base because those strings are not being minified. Everything else may be A dot B as an invocation method, but then the string is going to always stay the same. So here we find where the log statement is being printed. And if we're looking at the details um, as the payload is being created, we see here that we have, oops, sorry, but however, the number of bedrooms is being placed to the number of bathrooms from the component. So that obviously is wrong. And what we want to do here is um, match this up in order to have the right mappings done within our code base. I'm going to save that and push it back to the scratch org. I'll just wait for that. Normally it takes a few seconds. And then we will refresh the page and see if this change actually fixes our, our issue. The important part here is, is like those logs become actually like uh, go beyond just reading the details. They help you with the navigation. They allow you to get like a full history about what's going on on the page. And especially in the lightning, come on. 
um, especially in the Lightning user interface, as you using different components of the app and switch between tabs, it actually maintains that context. So if you're using uh, features such as, if you're going back here, um, like the Dreambot at the same time, you would see that in the same log. So we know that the user interacted with different components on this custom page. And, and that sometimes helps you to get and understand the path and how they got there to experience the issue. Because sometimes there are preconditions that lead to a bug in a very different um, portion of the, of the code. Oh, uh, it conflicted, didn't like that. So we need to push with, uh, with the force and all the right conflicts. Apologize for that. And once that is done, we can do the refresh to conclude the demo. And I made the changes. Um, this should be good now. I made the changes. Um, did it do it? Maybe it's the demo effect. Now let's give it a try. If not, it should have worked. <laughs> Um, I did the, the changes on the configuration side on a global level, but you would only do this for a particular user. So you would create in the custom settings for that user. Um, yeah, that's better. It actually deployed this time and you can see that all the results with the three bathrooms were now removed. So we successfully, successfully fixed the issue. Um, Going back to what I was just saying, I was actually making changes here on a global level, um, but normally what you would do in such a situation is create a new override for that particular user so that only they would be reporting on an info level and everyone else stays on the regular um, fatal side on, a, on an operational configuration, which is one of the strengths of the hierarchical custom settings that I really love. All right, so that concludes our demo. And from here, we're going on to talk about the other two modules quick to wrap up, uh, wrap up our presentation. So next in line is the feature switches. Um, the general concept of how I develop uh, functionality is I wanna create an experience for the developers as well as like the admins. It, it, you know, it, I mean, the, the lines are getting um, a lot more merged anyways. There's no strict differentiation anymore, especially with those um, strong tools such as Flow and Process Builder. Um, and I'm staying true to my, my concept as well that I want to see everything as much as possible to be configurable so that you don't actually have to ever modify anything in, in, my, in the code base in order to accommodate behavior that is specific to your org. So when it comes to the feature switches, I decided to do the entire configuration through custom metadata in order to activate and deactivate the features and you just saw that in the demo. But when you go down the custom metadata approach, you gain the advantage of being able to deploy feature switches and make that part of your deployment pipeline, but you're losing the hierarchical uh, configuration of custom settings. And I didn't want to do that because for feature switches, the hierarchy actually is super valuable features. So I decided to just build it into the logic for the feature switches themselves. So you can now set feature switches on a global level, on a, a profile level, user level. And in addition to that, I added function uh, like functionality to support public groups. So you can set it to a public group and then all the users that are belonging to that group would honor that feature switch. And it goes from the smallest um, level like user, group, profile, global, as it's trying to resolve what feature switch should be applied to a particular user base that allows you to do A-B testing um, or, or like a procedural rollout of any new functionality for different groups. Obviously, feature switches are valuable in many different places. Um, we have the Epic site for sure. Then the same thing, you want to be able to consume feature switches on the client side and maybe display different type of uh, UI components in your code base. So you have access to utilities that allow you to quickly and easily do that in your or an LWC code. And you have utilities on the Apex, uh, not Apex, sorry, on the flow and process builder side to um, evaluate features, which is there with the full hierarchy um, through invocable Apex. So that's, that's very, very helpful there too. You can also use feature switches in formulas, but there's one caveat around it, and that is the hierarchical feature doesn't work there because you actually need to reference a particular switch um, record. And, and uh, one switch record can only be 
like one of the levels. So you need to typically revert to going and, and man, like go with the global settings only for, for uh, using validation rules or and using feature switches in any kind of formulas. And here's just an example on uh, how you would like use the feature switch framework in, in various different situations. So you have on the top here, the LWC way of writing the code um, or on the right hand side, we have the formula that you just saw in the demo. And here's an example on how you would include feature switches in a flow where you retrieve the feature, feature switch um, using the invocable apex and then load it into a variable. And then you can do decision making processes based on the feature switch value. And then at the bottom, obviously, there's Apex, um, which is pretty straightforward from a class consumption or utility class consumption perspective. Last but not least, let's talk about the trigger framework. Um, I know many people in this room are very familiar with trigger frameworks, so I'm not going to make a long spiel about that. I want to just highlight some of the benefits of how the RFLIP framework has implemented. Um, like the, the RFLIP implementation of triggers. And so one of the advantages is it's fully decoupled. What does that mean? It means that every Salesforce, real Salesforce trigger that you write is a one-liner. As you're adding new handlers, you don't have to change the trigger itself. That's all done through configuration. It also instantiates those handlers dynamically, which means there's no linkage between the actual physical trigger and the uh, and, uh, act, and the handler execution that's abstracted. And that means you can simplify unit testing with that. You can unit test your triggers without actually doing a DML operation, which would be my recommended way. It makes the trigger handling more stable, um, meaning that if you, for instance, someone uh, creates a new validation rule that is uh, important when it comes to the creation of your test records, but not important for the purpose of your trigger handler, if you're doing a DML, your unit test would fail. If you're not doing a DML and just provide the payload that is relevant to your handler, you are actually fine and your test will continue to pass despite like uh, other changes in the environment. Um, because I, I don't know how it is with you guys, but for myself, like I've been in too many orgs where I made a change like in one corner of the work and then suddenly I had unit test failures in a completely different area just because of the dependencies that were there. The trigger framework um, is fully configurable. It's based on custom metadata as a lot you can configure there despite like obviously activation, deactivation, you can define the execution order. And one thing that we'll take a look at in, in the next slide is, is actually an error handling as well, which is special about this particular framework as well. And then it's fully transparent. It's integrated with the locking framework. So whenever you have any transaction that involves um, triggers, you will see details about what handlers were found for the DML operation, which ones were executed, where, where was an error thrown, and all those sorts of things, they are automatically locked for you. All of this was inspired by Dan Appleman's um, advanced Epics programming book. Um, I just basically took what he put in the book as an initial implementation, then continued to improve upon it over the years. So here we're seeing the configuration. Um, we are providing a class name. This is the class that is going to be instantiated that needs to implement the RFLIP interfaces for the framework, what object we are listening on, um, what event this particular trigger is associated with, the order it's going to be executed in, and then we have the exception behavior. There are two values that you can use. One is aborting the transaction, which means that if your handler throws an error, like RFLIP will forward the error and everything goes up, or you can say continue. And that is really handy. Let's say you have three different trigger handlers on the account object, and they're each doing an atomic task, meaning they are independent from one another, modifying like data on the account um, based on based on on whatever changes or modifications and updates were done on the record. Now, if one of them fails, why should the other ones not be able to complete and continue? All it does. By, by failing means that you have triple the work to actually fix because everything failed. Whereas when you um, go with the continue exception behavior, what you will get out of is that the other two triggers would still, handlers would still pass and execute their run successfully. The framework would lock that there was an error with the third one. And then you only need to make the uh, data modification and fixes for whatever got wrong or missed in the third um, trigger and not for all of them. 
So you have a lot more control about how you want the triggers to behave. And that's with all of the features. And I wanna close up with a couple more stories to show the value of the framework um, in, in project that I've been involved in. Um, I worked on a, on a big CRM transformation project where we had like a mid-sized company that went from a legacy CRM to Salesforce. And it was an all or nothing deployment approach, meaning on Friday, uh, the user signed off on the old CRM. We worked hard over the weekend to get all the data ported over. And then on Monday, they were starting out in Salesforce. And needless to say, there were like quite a few errors that happened during the first day and that were reported through an, a very early iteration of the framework as, uh, on the APIC side. There was a lot of integration involved. So we had on the first day over 200 errors um, that were being posted. And, but because of the, the details of logging that we had in place, we were able to actually group those errors into less than 10 categories. Um, some of which were data related and others were functionality where we actually had bugs in our code base. Within 48 hours after go live, we reduced this number from a daily error perspective to less than 50 errors per day. And most of them we could always prove were data related where there needed to be uh, changes made to the records in order to make the integration work because there was a lot of bad data that came from the legacy system. The customer was super happy with that because this allowed us to, within a week, um, get them to the actual productivity levels that they were used to from their old CIM because we were able to resolve those errors very, very quickly. And within two to three weeks after go live, we started to see the initial return of the investment where their user base was actually perform outperforming their previous, um, their previous CIM from a sales perspective. The other example that I want to bring up is a full development cycle where iFlip was used uh, from the ground up to develop customizations within uh, a customer community. And it was heavily aura based and, and, and development driven. So there was a lot of front end code that was happening. And we used obviously good locking practices and, and they were able to help us like through the entire process. For once, when we came to UAT testing, Anytime new functionality was um, deployed to UAT and the tester started, and we would get any kind of error scenarios that we didn't capture uh, catch in, in during development, we would have an email notification sent out to us. And we were able to look at the logs already before the tester started to even write a bug report. And, and so what usually took about 30 minutes or more from a debugging perspective, tester like saying, hey, open the bug, we are engaging with them, they're reproducing it or showing us what they've done, etc. In most cases, within less than five minutes, either I was already working on a bug fix, or I could tell them, hey, there was a data issue because they were creating their own test data that was not realistic. Um, can you please fix this and that, uh, especially when it came to the integration that was very, very useful. And then as we went into um, the pre-production stages and started doing load testing, we actually found a race condition where we used the force.record data uh, component from Salesforce, the data service, in order to save changes to um, on the UI to the server. What we found out is we had like two changes being done um, very quickly, one after another. So there were two safe requests coming out from the record data um, component. And while they came, like where sent from the client, JavaScript client in order, on the server side through field history, we were able to actually prove that they were actually processed on the Salesforce side in reverse order. So we um, were able to identify that through the locking framework and, and then go in and put in some um, basically sequencing from the code to make sure that, that these race conditions cannot happen. And last but not least, once the production rollout happened, because of the integration that, that was part of the feed, uh, functionality that we had, there were obviously certain data scenarios that we had never tested. And there's no environment like productions, we all know that. So the framework then in production helped us to identify issues that the clients were actually experiencing, alerted us to it, and we were able to action them within the first two days after go live and making sure they didn't go undetected for the longest time because our client's um, customer base is, is not the most chatty one when it comes, or the most vocal one when it comes to these type of issues. So three key benefits that that I feel RFLIP brings to the table is it really helps to 
create faster development cycles because it is it helps you to create better quality code as well as as it will drive um, any kind of debugging scenarios as you go through so UAT cycles and resolve those a lot faster. Um, there's definitely going to be faster pod support. I hope I could definitely bring across that value. And you have a lot more control about the execution of your environment, especially when you look at the uh, trigger framework and the way how you can orchestrate the execution um, of, of those handlers. Version 2.7 was released last weekend. I always like to create new versions and releases uh, before I go on to community events. So um, here you have all the package links uh, to install it. You can use the code base. You can install the packages. As I said, they are unlocked packages, which means no namespace. You have access to the code base. You can take files and overwrite them. That's very much possible, though I would encourage you to kind of like uh, stay on the, on the package path so you can take advantage of the latest features without overriding your customizations. And then with that, I want to reiterate one more time, the most important part is logging is important. So I hope that I could at least um, get that message across. I thank you all for listening uh, to my presentation. I hope you liked it. Feel free to reach out to me with questions even after this conversation. I have a blog that I occasionally write into. Um, you see the repository here, open feature requests, open bug reports. Um, I try to be as responsive as possible as family and work allows for it. And uh, I hope I got you excited and you will try out the framework. So if you do like it, please advertise it, tell your friends, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>